Hey everyone, so today I'm joined by Chris Hatfield, who's the founder and coach of Sales Psyche, which is a platform focused on mental well-being for people in sales. Today I'm talking to Chris all about how to start having the conversation about mental health in sales. Thanks so much for joining me, Chris. Yeah, thank you very much, Jack. Pleasure to be here. No worries. So, I mean, here at Jiminy, our mission is very much about making sure that salespeople can become the best version of themselves. Now, a lot of people look at that in terms of the platform and what we provide in terms of enabling them to improve their performance and automate a lot of their responsibilities as a rep. But when I think about becoming the best version of yourself, it doesn't just boil down to how you can perform on the job, but also how you can become and grow as a person, as an individual. And when I came across Sales Psyche, I was really interested in talking to you all about how salespeople and sales leaders in particular can take the steps to start having the conversation about mental health. I mean, I was really interested to pick your brain in particular, mostly to start with about, you know, what do you see as the current state of mental health discussions within sales teams? Yeah, it's a really good question. I think it's one of the, re one of the things that actually sparked the creation of sales psych. I think, first of all, what the pandemic, of course, is a terrible thing and a lot of bad things have happened from it. But I think one of the positives that have come out of it is probably just a, um, people taking mental health a lot more seriously for what it should be and, and, and not to where it should be, because I think, still think we've got a long way to go. But I think people still being confident, a bit more confident now to talk about it. But it's still very much from a crisis point of view, as in something has happened we need to talk about. It. And I think people are getting a bit better now at doing something about it but I think you know within that kind of arena we were talking about this before is there's more blurred lines now of not being able to break up work from home there's people who are working remotely whereas you know they haven't got that culture around them there's people who are being hired that have never met anybody they work with uh, you know it's it's no longer and it never was about that kind of flashy office and all those kind of things but even more now than ever companies have really got to make sure that that culture that psychologically safe culture is there in to support people in that in that remote manner so i feel like it's it's got better but i still feel like you know it's it's not like we're we're still behind i feel like you know what we're doing now what we're encouraging people to do is is basic hygiene it's not a nice to have it's the the, the essentials yeah no i completely agree mate i mean one stat that really stood out to me on your website was that 56 percent of reps don't feel comfortable talking to their line manager about the issues that they're struggling with mentally. How do you think sales leaders can, you know, bring this to their team, start that conversation so that sales reps can feel more comfortable having these conversations? Yeah, it's a good question. I think there's there's two or three things that come to mind. I think the first thing is address, always addressing the elephant in the room. Um, I think particularly with new starters, but when people are coming into the business, it's great to tell them, here's the company's vision, here's what we want to achieve, here's the money you can make, here's what we sell. But very rarely do you hear like after two or three weeks when you get told no or this is what's happened, you're going, to, you're going to feel burnt out after a few months. So you're going to feel like maybe this job isn't for me. Having those conversations is really important because if you don't, people get to the point where they think, oh, well, they mentioned all this great stuff, but they haven't told me about this stuff. Maybe I'm the only one that feels like this. Maybe I'm not right for the business. Maybe I'm not right for sales. Maybe I'm not right for the culture. Maybe I'm doing something wrong and because no one else has talked to me about it. Who do I go and speak to about it? So having that conversation instantly makes them feel like, oh, so-and-so, Jack told me this, I'd feel like this. Well, now I'll go and speak to Jack about it. And you can kind of catch those things sooner. I think that's a big thing. Another thing is, you know, it's all very well going. We've got an open door policy. Come to us if you want to talk about things. But of course, you know, if I'm new into the business or even if I've been there, I'm thinking, well, you know, I want to, I don't want to make myself look like the weak link, as my, some people might think, or Am I going to be judged for this? I think leaders have got a real responsibility. And the old phrase is be the change you wish to see in others. If you want people to start talking about this more, you've got to start that conversation. You've got to be that person that shares, that opens up, that talks about when things aren't going right. And it, people get confused around this with vulnerability and accountability and thinking that the more vulnerable I am, the less accountable people can become or, and the other way around. Whereas they can go hand in hand. You can still be vulnerable and still hold people accountable towards it and I think you know just by being honest and telling people why you're having some time off why you're you know finishing at the end of the day how tough your morning has been but if you can still talk about uh, I had uh, for example I was mentioning him Dom Taylor from Award Gateway one of the uh, mm -hmm. senior leadership team there and 
and he, he had a meeting with the team and they said, oh, he said, how's everyone doing? They were like, oh, I'm all right. He was like, guys, I had the shittest morning. Like, I had to go and have a lie down at lunch. I never do that. But here's what I'm going to do this afternoon to, to move forwards on it. And instantly everyone was like, oh, do you know what? Same here. This is how I've been feeling. And it wasn't like a, a venting piece. There was a bit of that, but it was still very constructive. He shared, but he also shared, I'm, I'm like you, but here's what I'm doing about it. So I think those are like two things that there's a lot more to this, of course, but I think those are two things that are really important to address the elephant in the room. And, and, and leaders, if you want to have this conversation, you need to start it um, to, to initiate that and make people feel comfortable that this is an okay conversation to have at work. So why do you think reps in particular feel so uncomfortable talking about this in particular? Is it a cultural issue within business? Is it more of a cultural issue as a nation, as a, you know, a, a globe, uh, as people just struggling to, to be able to bring up the, these topics in conversation? What do you think are the main drivers behind that at the moment? Yeah, I think first, I think the biggest thing is the stigma around it is that that's because it's not talked about as much. You know, you talk about, um, you know, physical health is talked about a lot more. And, um, you know, it's interesting when people ask me sometimes, of, oh, what's the, what's the ROI of what you do? And I, and I sometimes ask, what's the ROI of your gym membership? Or what's the ROI of your bar bill? Um, and they're like, I don't know. It's like, well, why are we treating mental health any different to um, physical health? But I think it's, it's the conversation around it that's like one of the biggest things that can, um, that makes people feel like that. And also just not wanting to, you know, particularly with a pandemic, people have lost their jobs is thinking, well, if I mention this, am I going to look because of the stigma attached to mental health? Um, you know, regardless of how good the culture is, you're still going to, you're still going to have people that feel like this is because if the next time they do some layoffs, are they going to pick me because I've said that I'm struggling or uh, that I'm burnt out or stressed, does that make them think I can't do my job? So those are the those are the kind of the, the two biggest things. And the, the other one which I mentioned before is because if it's not talked about in the business, if it's just something you put on your website, um, but not actually talked about day by day around some of these topics and themes, then people will not talk about it because they think, well, you know, this kind of uh, toxic positivity that I've been talking about a bit more recently of coming where everyone's pretending everything's great and it's, yeah, we're doing really well. And, and yes, you might be, but be honest you still have tough days everyone does so, so be honest with people when you do rather than making people feel like you're the odd one out if you're not feeling pumped every single day when you work come to work mm -hmm. that's a great point um you mentioned just now about the you know the lines becoming more and more blurred since we've entered the pandemic with you know more and more people working remotely um you know in, in my experience it has been you know quite a, a struggle adapting to working in a remote environment i guess the lines between work life and personal life have become more and more blurred i mean we're chatting right now in my bedroom about you know two meters from where i sleep but in sales in particular sales has always been a very high pressure industry and you mentioned that two in three sales people are close to or have experienced burnout um at some point in their careers and salespeople are three times more likely to struggle with their mental health you know working with so many people in sales why do you think that is in particular i think there's this constant um feeling of of the chase um, and we even when even when you achieve what you set out to do it's then like either you've got to start again or your targets increase and you've got to go again there's that constant like uh, you know, and it's, it's, that's why it's so dangerous to, to get that kind of mindset where all you're focused on is, is the outcome. Because what happens is a lot of people then place their self-worth and self-belief and value in the outcome. And because sales is something that you, when you, particularly when you start out or whenever you've got to put a lot of time and effort in, people start neglecting their kind of non-work identities, like who you are outside of work, a brother, a boyfriend, a husband, a, a wife, a coach, a volunteer. And they kind of like, they just judge themselves on their job title. And when that isn't going well, they, they kind of don't acknowledge all the value they're bringing to people outside of work. And that's where it can kind of have a, a real challenge. And, and obviously because of sales, you know, there's, there's so many knockbacks, there's so many uncontrollables, things that you can't, you can't account for. Um, and, you know, it's not just saying like, it's not just sales that have been hard hit by this. Of course, a lot of people have, but with sales, you know, you, you, you could be thinking this is going in, of course, this time last year, and you think, oh, they've pulled the plug because of COVID. Um, you have these expectations in your head around that and of course when you feel like you're constantly chasing something you're constantly putting your body into that flight or flight state because you're either there and you thinking oh i don't want to stop because i want to maintain it well i can't take time off because i've got good momentum or 
if you're not, I can't take time off because, you know, I'm going to look like I'm snacking off or I'm going to be even further behind my target. If I use the analogy, it's a bit like a, a Formula One race. Like wherever you are on the grid, you've got to go in for a pit stop because if you don't, your tyres will burn out. You'll run out of fuel. Um, and regardless of like where you are, you, you need to do it. And I think there's things companies can do about that. Um, but also I think it's, it starts with the companies. I think it's setting that tone. Um, you know, I've, I've known a couple of companies that have now built in that people have to take their time off in that quarter as part of their OKR. Otherwise they can't hit target if they haven't taken that time off. Um, I know other companies that have now like after a quarter or a month said, look, take the next working day off everyone in the business. And then we'll go again, just to give that kind of space. So you don't feel like you're instantly back at it. Um, but I think it's, it's the companies that start this, this tone. This is where it all starts with. That's a really, really good point. It definitely starts with the company. And we're fortunate enough here at Jiminy that we've got sales leaders who really, really do factor in our personal well-being as well. And I know that a lot of companies are really looking to take the step in the right direction, but it's individuals that have to take that step. So as an individual who might be listening, who wants to take that first step into you know, bringing this to their team and having these more positive, well-rounded conversations how do you start to implement it as a going concern i think one thing that i've suggested recently is and this also allows to build that kind of collaboration in the team rather than just coming to them and thinking oh i'm going to talk about this topic is it really simply for your next team meeting do a google form and just go right everyone submit two or three ideas of what you think could could work and it could be around well-being it could be in general but it could if you want to base it around well-being what are some of the things we could do? It's anonymous. So no one feels under pressure to think, oh, what happens if I get judged for saying this? And then at least you can go through them before. And in that meeting, you're like, right, this is one of the ideas. How do we make that happen? Or one of the ideas might be, but by getting the ideas, first of all, you know what's on your team's mind without them feeling like they can't tell you. Um, and secondly, it then means that you start collaborating with them to kind of think, okay, this isn't just about you as a manager and leader doing all this. What can they be doing as well to kind of collectively do something about it so i think that's really important um and also just sharing it as i mentioned before sharing experiences sharing where you've been burnt out in the past sharing where you've suffered with imposter syndrome i think you know vulnerability is a, is a real strength it kind of been get labeled as a weakness sometimes as a leader you think oh i can't tell them this because what they're not going to think i'm an effective manager is they will because they'll see you as a human being as well which is like the whole way in which they can build trust of you to then feel comfortable like that to then feel like beyond the well-being piece that I want to work for this person and with this person um, and, and look at the group collective rather than just thinking, I just want to hit my target is I want to do well for this person in my team. I want to do everyone well for everyone else because of the, the collective trust we're creating. That's really, really, really interesting. I mean, going back to the pandemic, since we've all started working a bit more remotely, the one thing we've lost more than anything is that personal connection and personal, you know, frequent interaction in an office space, now everyone is behind a computer screen and a lot of the contact that we have with people in our teams, the wider company, aren't by the water cooler or in the lunch canteen anymore. They're in our team meetings. So as a leader or as a, you know, just another person within a company who has concerns about another individual, what are the signs that people should be looking out for that someone might be struggling with burnout and you know afraid to take um the steps to voice those concerns and how should that be approached in your opinion yeah it's a good point and it is harder now because you can't see someone you know someone can seem like they're holding it together on a zoom call and then completely collapse on their desk afterwards or just go back to bed or you know be like on the friday thinking yeah it's all good turn the camera off and then they're you know they can't move for the weekend um i think you know don't underestimate the power of a, of a phone call outside of uh, your one-to-ones sporadically just calling someone out of the out of the blue um, maybe even near the end of a, a working week like on a Friday uh, you know and, and only if you're going to check in with them not check on them but check in with them and ask you know Jack um, and, and coming from a place of you know uh, of positive of, of wanting to support them and not checking in and going oh I've noticed you've not been doing well this week I've noticed you haven't been doing this many calls is do you know what Jack I've noticed you've not been your usual self this week um, you know, performance, anything off the table, like, I just want to check in, like, how are you doing? And, or how are you doing really? And, and then say to them that you don't have to talk about it now, but I just want to let you know, if at any point you feel like you need to talk to someone, I'm here. 
don't put pressure on just because you want to have the conversation and they then have to have the conversation at the time with you. Um, and don't be afraid to change the type of question you ask. You ask people, how are you? It's a very standard response is, you know, you can ask what's on your mind or on a scale of one to 10, how are you feeling today? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, Ollie Sharp's really good about the sales off. He'll ask the team, you know, they've got it to a team level now, but it started off as one to one of on a scale of one to 10. How's everyone feeling this morning? Um, and it, it's just a different way of rather than going, yeah, I'm all right is, well, if you've got to give me a number, it, okay, if it's a nine, great. Like, what's the reason behind that? Or a four, well, okay, what, what's the reason behind that? It, it expands the conversation rather than just going, oh, you're right, yeah, I'm all right, you're right, yeah, I'm all right, right down to business. I love that. I love the, you know, attention to, to detail and actually focusing on the human element of it. I think the more you present someone as a human and actually factor that in them as a person, people can feel listened to, people can feel respected and, and, you know, feel more comfortable sharing these things as well. So, you know, working with so many sales teams um, in this environment, what are the kind of impacts you see when companies do start to prioritize mental health as something they're going to really focus on and, and talk about? What are the kind of tangible impacts, whether that's performance related, um, you know, employee retention related, are there any kind of impacts that you see um, come to sales companies? Yeah, I mean, Deloitte released a study last year showing for every pound spent now, the average ROI is five pounds back if we want to talk the figures here. I mean, it's been as high as 11 to one as well um, for that. And I think, you know, if we're talking about numbers there, because it because it costs the, for every 10 people, it could be costing you about 16 and a half grand and 43 working days lost. But I think when companies start to do it, the biggest thing you see and we see, um, you know, not just talking about sales psyche here, but from what I've seen with other companies is gratitude is that you know, recognition and, and also realizing that, you know, you're, you're not just investing as me, in me as a salesperson, you're investing in, in me as a person. That's the biggest thing here is by doing something about this, they're recognizing you're not just doing this because of my number. Obviously, it's going to help them with that. But above all, the first and foremost, most important thing is we want to look after you as a person and then your job title and your number and everything comes secondary to that. Um, so I think that's a, that's a big thing that you can kind of see an initial reaction around it and and from it you see you know you see turnover reduced you see people feeling more open and um more honest around wanting to have these conversations people you know some people might say listening to this and i've heard it in the past of are you giving people an excuse if you start talking about this more in the business um well if you know if people are going to use it as an excuse it's, it's probably your fault because you hired them it's the wrong kind of culture if you've got people in there but what you have got at the moment, you know, when we first started talking about physical health, were people worried about, oh, what happens if they say they've got a stomach bug? Or what happens if they say they've got the flu or they've got a cold? Well, they're probably saying that at the moment, but it probably isn't that. It probably is they're burnt out. It probably is that they're stressed. But wouldn't you rather than be honest and feel comfortable telling you that than going silent about it and just labeling it as something else? Mm -hmm. no, I love that. I really, really do love that. So, I mean, I mentioned at the start that you are the founder and coach of Sales Psyche, you know, with mental health awareness coming up, uh, mental health awareness week coming up, it's something that's on my mind that, you know, this is a topic that shouldn't just be for the week that mental health yeah. awareness week is, it's something that should be more of an ongoing conversation. But, you know, can you explain to people what you do at Sales Psyche and, and the types of companies that you help um, and what you really, really focus on in, in your sessions? Sure. Yeah. No, just to build on that point, I think it's really important not to have this week as an outlier, but if anything, it's a Kickstarter. It's something that if you haven't been doing anything about it, use this week. And I always say to people, if, you, if the simplest way is to think, whatever you're doing this week, think about how do we scale this to happen each week? You know, rather than just getting people to come in and do a talk or, you know, having a, a theme this week and putting it out on LinkedIn and looking amazing to everyone else is, well, what are your team seeing every single day? Are they feeling that or are they just feeling like it's more for show because that's going to have more of a ne negative impact um, in the long run as well. But yeah, sales psyche, our, you know, my mission statement, it, obviously we're aligned to, to Jimmy on this and a few other people in the industry, but you know, ours is all around creating healthier minds and um, sales pipelines and vibrant cultures. We, we use, I use the analogy, it's a bit like a gym for your mental health, uh, well-being, and performance. So we provide live and on-demand sessions from morning mindset sessions, mini workshops, anonymous Q and A's where people can come and ask those burning questions that they don't know who to ask. Um, and also a space for people to book one-to-one -one confidential and impartial sessions as well to, to have conversations. So we work with, um, we, we've 
started doing individual memberships just at our request, but we work mainly with SaaS and technology companies. Um, and we, we work with teams anything from 10 to 150 globally as well. Awesome. Well, I, I, you know, I really, really appreciate your time today, Chris. I love what you're doing at Sales Psyche. Um, for anyone watching that would like any information on Sales Psyche, we'll link it in um, in the blog post above um, or on our LinkedIn comments. Um, feel free to get in touch with Chris directly. Um, and yeah, Chris, thank you so much for your time. Yeah, you're welcome. You're welcome, Jack. And I think for anyone what, watching or listening to this who who is thinking about this and maybe struggling themselves, I think, you know, the biggest thing is is having that conversation is, you know, finding someone to speak to. And just on a last point here, I always recommend it's not just down to that person, but if you can find people in the business that you can say, do you want to be my mental health buddy? Uh, if I said that to you, Jack, and I gave you permission to go, Jack, if you see me on a Zoom call and I'm not being myself or in a Slack, it doesn't have to be your manager, somebody you have a good relationship with. You checking in with me, because I've given you permission, I'm less likely to be defensive about it. I'm less likely to push you away. And what it does, it means I get more comfortable talking about this. I get more proactive thinking about it. And it stops me getting to a crisis point where maybe I don't know who to or how to talk about it. So I think it's really important to be proactive with this and, and find people you feel comfortable with to give permission to check in with you um, and start having those conversations. Just for the record, Chris, I'd love to be your mental health buddy if you ever needed it, mate. <laughs> um, but what a beautiful note to finish on. I really, really love that. Thanks so much for your time, Chris. Um, hope you have a good week, mate. Um, and I'll catch up with you soon. Yeah, thanks, Jack. And thanks, everyone. Catch you soon.